Are you wondering what all you can do with the Stroke Studio and Affine Designer on iPad? Well, that's what we're here to talk about today. Stroke is the outline of an object. In the video on the Color Studio, we learned how to set the color of the Stroke and Affine Designer on iPad. But there's a lot more to Stroke than that. You know, some objects won't have any stroke at all, they'll just be a fill, and then other objects will have both a fill and a stroke, and then there will be objects that have only a stroke and no fill. And especially when you are using lines as design elements, like we just talked about recently on my Instagram account, then you really only have stroke to work with. So it's worth making sure that you know how to do everything that's inside of the Stroke Studio. So let's go ahead and dive into Affinity Designer on iPad and learn all we can about the Stroke Studio. All right, so here we are in Fane Designer on the iPad, and you can see I've set up a number of different lines and shapes here on the artboard so that we can see different things. Let's go ahead and select one of them. Now the Stroke Studio is the third icon down on the right hand side, and it looks kind of like a fountain pen stroke. So you can see my stroke is yellow, so the color of the Stroke Studio actually changes depending on what color your stroke actually is. This is very similar to the Color Studio that we've talked about previously. Right now you can see I'm just on a line so I have no fill, so the Color Studio is showing no fill. The first thing to know about the Stroke Studio is that you can actually make an adjustment on your selected object without even opening up the studio. You can just swipe up or down on the icon to change the stroke size. So as I swipe up, this stroke size increases, and if I swipe down, it will decrease. I'll just tap undo a couple times to get back to where we were before. I love this swipe up and swipe down feature because it makes it super easy to change up the stroke on the fly. Next, let's go ahead and tap on the studio to open it up. You will notice right away that it doesn't look like there's much here, but this is because most of the stroke options are hidden under the advanced dropdown. We will get to those advanced features in a second, but first let's just take a look at what we have in the default. We of course have the name stroke and the push pin at the top just like in every studio. Then we have a series of icon that represent the style of our stroke. The box with a blue line through it means no stroke. So you'll see the stroke disappear when I tap on that. Next there's the stroke symbol which makes a solid stroke. And then the dotted line symbol which makes your stroke into a dotted line. And then the brush symbol which will allow you to apply a brush to your stroke. We'll look at each of these in order. First to the solid stroke. When this is turned on, you get a solid standard stroke that is the same across the entire length of the line. And then you can use the width slider to do what we did before by swiping up and down on the stroke studio. So we can just drag that left and right. All right, let's undo that. If you tap on the width slider, you will get the calculator input option so that you can put in an exact option. This is great if your whole design is using one stroke weight and you want to just be able to set that exactly. Below the width slider, you will find the pressure curve. This is where you can adjust the amount of pressure that follows along the line. So right now it's at the top and that means that everything will have 20.5 points of width across the entire line. But if we drag the first dot down, you can see that on the left hand side, it really goes down into a point so that it's going to almost zero width at the very beginning of the line. We can drag the other line down as well and you'll see the line basically completely disappear. You can also add other points along this curve. So if we tap in the middle, we'll get another point and we can drag that up so that we can get a tapering effect along the whole length of our line. You can add as many points as you want and make different adjustments to them to give your line a different width and effect along the whole length of the line. If we want to delete a point along the curve, we can just tap it and then we'll get the delete node option. We can also tap on a point to get the reset pressure option. This will reset it to full pressure across the entire line. All right, next we have the dotted line option. This turns our line into a series of dots. You can see that we still have our width setting here, just like we did before. And as our width gets bigger, we get less dots. And as our width gets smaller, we get more dots. I'll just undo that. Below that we have the dash pattern options. The dash and gap options are pretty self-explanatory. If we drag right on the dash option, it will increase the length of our dashes. If we drag to the left, it will decrease the length of our dashes. If we drag right on the gap option, it will increase the gap. If we drag left, it will decrease the gap. The phase option can be a little bit trickier to understand. Let me just increase the dash a little bit here so that you can see this better. As we change the phase, it actually changes where the line starts and stops along the dash. So if you ever awkwardly have a dash about halfway cut off, you can go ahead and adjust the phase so that you get as close to the complete dash line as possible. Or if you have the line kind of end 
on a gap. That can look a little bit weird and not show the complete length of your line. So you can adjust the face to get the line looking just the way that you want it. All of these circle controls can be tapped on so that you can input a very specific number. So you want a dash of two, you can just do that. Lastly, for the dotted line, you can see that there is no pressure curve. So a dotted line will always have even pressure along the entire length of the dotted line. For our last option, we have the brush option. So let's go ahead and tap on that. And you can see that by default, it looks the same as just the solid stroke option. We have the width and we have the pressure curve. But if we go into the brushes studio, which is something we'll talk about more in a later video, we can now choose a brush and that brush will take effect on the line. So there are a lot of different brushes you can choose from with different types of settings. So you can try out a bunch of these, but it's really useful to be able to apply your brush stroke to a line, especially if you're using that brush to do other types of hand-drawn artwork in your design. It can be really useful to be able to apply that same brush to other lines that are being made by the vectors in your design. And you can see that this actually adjusts the width based on what the brush setting is. And we can also go ahead and change our pressure curve to give this kind of a different hand-drawn feel. Let's go back to our solid line and reset the width to the 20.5. Now that we know all of the basics, we're going to start looking at the advanced options. So to open this up, just tap advanced down at the bottom and you can see a lot more options open up. The first option that we see is the cap. This determines what the ends of the line look like. So I have three lines here so that I can show you the difference between these. First off, let's start with the round cap. That rounds out each of the ends of the line. It only rounds out the end points of a line. Now let's go to the next one. This one is squared off at the end of the line. So instead of encompassing it, if we go to the top one, you can see, we'll zoom in here, that these round caps actually encompass the point of the line. Whereas down here, where we have this squared off at the end of the line option, it actually stops at the end of the line. Let's go to the third one and we'll change it to the squared off option that encompasses the points. So now those points are encompassed. This is very similar to the other one, except that it makes it a little bit longer. So this will adjust the length of your line a little bit, depending on what your cap is. So it's important to understand where you can go to change that. These only apply to open lines though. If I go to a shape here, and I change these, you can see that nothing happens. That's where the join comes in. The next set of options is the join, and the join affects any point on a line that has a line coming in and going out of it. That's why it's called a join. So first we have the round join, then we have the bevel join, and then we have the miter join. Now the miter is special in that this miter limit at the bottom of this section has to be adjusted in order for it to work. Right now you can see that it's creating the square off look, which is what we want. But if this miter is dropped all the way down to zero, it then creates exactly the same look as the bevel does. The miter limit is using some kind of math that I don't really understand, but I'm going to go ahead and link to a video here by Rick Corrigador that explains what is happening using Illustrator, but it's the same math I think that Affinity is using here. Basically what you need to know is that you need to adjust the miter limit until your corner stops being beveled and starts being sharp. So in the case of this square, that happens right around one and a half, but it could be different depending on what you're looking at. So let's go to this chevron line over here. And if we set that to mitered, those are square. But if we come down to this angle and we set that to mitered, you can see that it is already cut off and I have to drag up further to get it to become a point. Basically, let me grab my arrow here so you can see, the more acute the angle, the higher that miter has to be set in order for it to work out. And there's some kind of mathematical formula that's happening there, but that basically sums up the basics of what you need to know. As I said, go ahead and check out Rick's video if you want more information on what's happening there. Let's go back to the shape here and we're going to talk about this alignment. So there are three options for alignment and basically this is dealing with the actual vector line that exists in your shape. That is the thing highlighted in blue and it, by default it is set to be half of the stroke on the inside of the line and half of the stroke on the outside of the line. But we can change that. If we adjust the alignment here to be on the inside, which is the next option, that entire stroke, all 20.5 points of that that width will jump to the inside of that. So nothing is going outside of the bounding box of that shape. Conversely, the next option is to align to the outside, which will put the entire stroke on the outside of the actual parameters of that shape. So you can achieve different effects with this, but it's good to know where this is. Normally I feel like the default is fine, but depending on what you're doing, you may want to adjust that. 
It's good to note with alignment options that nothing you do to an open line will change the alignment. It will always be to the middle. So even if we go change that to the outside or the inside, nothing changes because there is no outside or inside to that line. So it will always be aligned to the middle of the actual vector line. Another thing to note with this is that these can affect each other. So for example, if we're on the square and we have it aligned to the inside, we can no longer use our round join. We can select it, but it won't do anything. Here, I'll tap off of this shape so that you can see. It is still square, even though the round join was selected. And that has to do with the way that it's working out the math there and that it's going all the way up to the edge of the box. So that's just important to know that these settings can affect each other. So you can try messing with them and adjusting different things to get different results. All right, after that, we get to the order option. So this determines if the stroke is in front or the fill is in front. If we set our stroke to the outside, this doesn't make any difference. You can see I can change the order and things remain exactly the same. But if we set our stroke to the inside, this becomes important because if we change to the fill being on top, our stroke will completely disappear. The thing is the entire shape is always being filled with that color, but the stroke normally is resting on top of it. If we set our stroke to be on the line, so half in and half out, you can see that if we put it behind, half of the stroke disappears, essentially making it a 10.25 line instead of a 20.5 line. So that's just good to be aware of the different options that you have there. The next option is a really important one. This is the scale with object option. And this can be on or off. When it's off, when you scale an object down, I'll just go ahead and shrink this object. The stroke does not change size. It remains at its size constantly. But as the object gets smaller, the ratio of the stroke to fill increases. So the stroke appears larger. But if you make it bigger, then the stroke will actually appear smaller because it doesn't actually change size. Go ahead and undo that. Whereas if we turn on scale with object, the stroke will always maintain its ratio to the object. So as we scale it down, the line remains looking the same in relation to how big the object is. The same as when we scale it up. So that's good to note because it can get really confusing when you take an object that you've made and you scale it down and the stroke doesn't react the way that you expect it to. So you can always come here and check whether it's set to scale with the object or not scale with the object. There are pros and cons to each one, so use it as you need it. I'm going to go ahead and turn it off for now. Finally, we get to the last section. Let's go ahead and just go to one of our lines here. These are our decorations for our start and end points. So you can see we have first the start point. So if I tap on that, we can then select what we want there. Let's try putting an origin circle there. Okay, so now we have that circle. And on the right side, we can select what's on the end point. Let's go ahead and put an arrow there. So these decorations can give your lines different feels. And they're very, very useful for kind of getting the point across that you're trying to make with the line. Right below those decorations is the option to scale it. So we can drag this down to make them smaller or up to make them larger in relation to the circle. In between those two settings, you can see the lock. So right now they are locked together, so they scale together. But if we unlock that, we can make the start point smaller while keeping the end point at 100%. All of these can of course be tapped on to bring up the calculator. So you can put that back in. And then at the bottom left, we have the option to choose whether the decoration stops where the line stops or if it begins where the line stops. So let me just show you how that changes. You can see this is similar to the way the caps work, whether or not they go just up to where the point is or whether they go past the point. And lastly, in the bottom right, we have this reverse option, which will switch the start and end points. So if we push that, we get the arrow on the left and the circle on the right. We push it again, it will reset. Woo, that is it. That is everything you can do in the Stroke Studio in Affinity Designer, and it is quite a bit. If you found this video helpful, go ahead and give us a big thumbs up. This is part of an ongoing series exploring everything in Affinity Designer on the iPad. So make sure you check out the playlist and subscribe for more videos. In the comments, let me know if I missed anything about the Stroke Studio or if you still have any questions about working with strokes in Affinity Designer. Thanks so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.